ask our uh, panelists to stand and come out of the front row here just for a moment uh, and introduce and just wave as I say your name, Phil, Phil Hubbard of uh, Stanford University Language Center. I will be our first speaker, followed by Michael Carrier. You see his bio up here, Cambridge English. Uh, Lorraine Matos from Sao Paulo, Rupert Inglesa, Marty Estelle, Department of State, and finally yours truly, Richard Boyan, also with Department of State. Uh, so to get the ball rolling, um, we'll ask Phil to give us a quick, a nice overview of our uh, six uh, commission papers. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I had a, what to me is a pretty challenging task, which is taking other people's work and trying to do it justice. Uh, I really wish we had the other authors here so that they could uh, explain their own work, but we don't. So I've got about one minute per paper <laughs> to, uh, to move us through this. Hopefully my watch won't fall over, because if it does, then I guess I have no time. Okay, I'm going to begin uh, with uh, Ken Beatty's uh, work on uh, Beyond the Classroom. That was the theme of his. Uh, he talks about the, how global learning is moving away from the classroom, and not just itself moving away from the classroom, but that language learning in general is moving away from the classroom because of global learning. Uh, he explains how learners may use their tools instead of for learning languages, uh, rather for augmenting reality. So if you can take a picture of the sign and get an immediate translation, why do you need to learn the language? Um, he also does a lot to link all to situated learning, that uh, part of the augmented reality and other s uh, settings where you can use the mobile material in the place that you're actually going to be using the language anyway. Uh, he identifies key issues for all of these stakeholders, which unfortunately I can't go through, but I'll comment on a couple of them. Uh, he does talk about uh, the importance for learners of these as enabling technologies and for learners to get control of them uh, and to actually lead them toward their own goals. Um, the idea that policymakers have to figure out what to do with the existence and uh, increasing ubiquity of these uh, devices. And um, for teachers to develop appropriate tasks and also to come to grips with the fact that students can get this information ready, readily. Uh, and employers to see how these can enhance the workplace uh, language learning setting uh, rather than getting in the way of it. Uh, as you'll see with many of these, pushes the idea of teacher development, and because the theme of the, the six papers is really applications of mobile learning to the workforce, he does bring in some points there and talks about the value of the just-in-time uh, aspect of mobile learning. The second paper uh, by Nikki Hockley is uh, following the theme of designer learning. The designers here are the teachers. Uh, you'll see in other places, uh, and even to some degree in this one, that the mobile learners themselves can do a lot of the design. But here the focus was on teachers. She ran a uh, very short, uh, actually two one-week uh, mini research studies on implementing mobile learning for communicative tasks. One group was, and she was a teacher and researcher, one group was uh, a group of A1 level, fairly beginning learners. And the second group was, uh, she said, about the B1 level, so a low intermediate to intermediate. Uh, in each case, she was trying to integrate the mobile learning activities uh, that they did outside of the class into the work in the class. Uh, she found six important parameters there. Uh, the hardware, so uh, for some students, it was bring your own device, BYOD, if you haven't heard that term. And some students did not have uh, 3G connection, and so they had to only work mobily where they could find the free wireless, which was often on the school campus. Uh, the idea of mobility is also tied in there, just how mobile are you, depending on what 
advice you have. Uh, she talked about the importance of recognizing technological complexity, trying to, especially in short-term programs like these, not have students do too much that was beyond what they could already do. Um, understanding their linguistic and communicative competence level, especially the lower level students. Uh, you'll see, I think on the next slide, it was a multicultural class, and so English was the only common language, but they had very little English, and that made communicative activities uh, problematic, as well as giving them instructions. Uh, the type of mobile activity, uh, and then the educational and learning context, how much in the classroom, how much out of the classroom, um, she brings up uh, uh, Mark Hagen's four types of mall, uh, content focused and tutorial focused, which she links to more behaviorist approaches, and then creation and communication types of mall, which are more uh, communicative and task oriented. Um, she says there are places for all of those. In talking about the study itself, she mentions that it was small scale, uh, that multilingual context added difficulties, uh, the low proficiency of the students added difficulties, and the relatively ad hoc nature of it. It was just a one week study, and it was done as part of uh, a normal class that she would be teaching. So, in some sense, you might think of it as action research. Um, but she did conclude that those six parameters are valuable and that it's also important to keep in mind uh, TPAC. That's an idea I think that will show up in other uh, papers here. Technological, pedagogical content knowledge. That is, what are the teachers able to do with what they know about the content, how to teach with that content, and then how to integrate the technology into it. Uh, she is quite competent in TPAC, but uh, in generalizing this to other teachers, that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, Agnes Kukulskopova uh, talked about reskilling learners, the idea that learners, in fact, don't automatically know how to do this stuff, that they need new skills. They can't just bring over uh, their digital native ideas of how they use mobile socially and be able to use them effectively in language learning. Uh, they also have to make connections between life and learning. Um, so that the, the learning that they do is not isolated from what they'll uh, do later. Again, this theme of situated learning. Uh, on the other hand, teachers need to be aware of what the learner's personal interests are and to try to work with the learners in finding content and communicative activities that make sense to them. And she points out that even though we have a lot of research on general learner strategies for language teaching, we don't really have much on learner strategies and learning styles as they relate to mobile learning. Um, she points out that different groups have different opportunities and challenges. She has a very nice uh, table for that. Uh, I, at the end, I think everyone will be encouraging you if you haven't already to go and look at these papers. Uh, give you the information on how to find them if you don't know them. Um, she talks about different models for this type of work, uh, specified activity models, proposed activity models, and driven models, and the fact, again, that we need studies across a wider variety of areas, and especially studies with more advanced scores. So much work has been done with more levels. Uh, the paper that I co-authored with Glenn Stockwell, uh, we took off as a starting point uh, three types of issues, physical issues, uh, which are very closely connected to the hardware and the mobile environment, pedagogical issues, how people can actually use this and connect it to learning objectives rather than just use objectives. Uh, a certain percentage of the, the work done in uh, all is really about language learning just through language use. And there's clearly a place for that, but there's also a place for intentional learning. Uh, and then the psychosocial issues, uh, including cultural ones. Uh, and one of the ones that Glenn has written about in other places is this idea of students seeing their mobile devices as more of their private communication devices and not necessarily something to be 
co-opted by teachers and classes for learning. Uh, not universally, but by some learners. Um, in the second part of the paper, we draw principles from Paul, from uh, Mall, and from mobile learning in general, trying to put those together and say, we can learn from mobile learning, not related to language learning. We can learn from computer-assisted language learning, not directly related to mobile learning. And then the mobile-assisted uh, language learning material itself. Uh, here are just five of the ten principles. Um, the idea that often you use mobile devices in distracting environments. You try to get students not to do that. You try not to give them tasks where they're split. Uh, the idea that you can push material at students, but you need to respect their boundaries when you do that. Uh, acknowledging learners' differences. Being aware of what they're already doing with their uh, mobile devices and how those might uh, be both enhanced and when they aren't doing what you think they need to be able to do uh, to provide them with better training. Uh, Paul Sweeney uh, had a, uh, an interesting research study here where he actually uh, interviewed educators involved in mobile learning and tried to look for evidence of differential benefits through their experiences. Doesn't mean mobile's better than something else, but that mobile is better for certain things than classroom or other types of activities. Uh, he structured interviews with seven practitioners across 10 classes, some of them had more than one class, and the reasons for all that they came up with uh, was efficiency, of course, um, relevance, but some other interesting ones, teacher motivation, they did it because they liked working with these devices and figuring out how to use them, student expectations, the students expected there to be technology in their classes. And then commercial imperatives, which was an interesting point, that they use mobile learning to distinguish themselves from others. Um, some key findings were that there's a limit to this notion of digital native. There are benefits from training. Um, Self-access is not something that comes automatically in some cultures because it undermines teacher authority, and both teachers and learners have issues with that. And the idea that laptops are mobile devices. With one of the groups, um, the laptop was what they had to use, and they could still move around with them in different places where they could find wireless and not connected to 3G. Um, and then key findings for teachers here, task appropriateness, teachers themselves should be mobile users, and the idea that the pedagogic context will be transformed. Um, John Traxler is the one person here, I think, who is less connected directly with language learning and is really a general, more general mobile learning specialist. Um, he talks about the characteristics of mobile learning, about how it's still largely unexploited. Uh, it's a modifier of learning. He uses the term outsourced cognition. Uh, that's for things like his translators and so on. Um, and it actually changes the way we interact with language. Um, he has a set of categories here. I'm running out of time, so uh, the one I'll point to I think at, the, at the bottom is very interesting. The shift from just-in-case learning, where you learn a bunch of stuff in the classroom so you can use it somewhere else, to just-in-time learning, where you pick up what you need on the spot, and therefore, in principle, it could have more impact. Uh, some of the challenges, he notes that most of the studies are very small scale. Uh, we don't know how they can be scaled up, how they can be sustained, even when we have good results. Do they mean anything for people in very different settings and with different motivations? Um, and the need to provide more evidence. Uh, he concludes with these uh, transformations very similar to what he began with, the idea of how it's mobile are transforming our ideas of space, place, identity, and community, that there are new social practices involved, the notions of knowing and learning are different now when you can find stuff out really quickly, and the changes in language and discourse. So uh, some quick final comments, and then you can see there, if you don't really want to write down that long, we are all of Is that on the handout that you're asking? 
If people don't, well, if you want to find these papers, you can just Google Turf Ball and you'll find them. Um, and I also want to point out that there's a language learning and technology special issue that came out the same month, October of last year. Uh, and language learning and technology is also uh, a free journal. Um, what I got from this is some general points cutting across multiple papers. We're not using mobile learning well yet for languages. The ideals that we have are more complicated than people come to I think they are. Teachers are not prepared. Learners are not prepared. Um, mall needs to be more situated than it often is. And the research is limited and not as conclusive. So those seem a little bit negative, but that's what we expect at the beginning here. I think that my colleagues who follow this, they will have some, uh, some more positive words of wisdom here. Uh, I am enthusiastic about it, and that's why I continue to work on it. Uh, I do want to point out one last thing, and that is even if we master what we got now, tomorrow, literally tomorrow, the technology is going to be different. We have to start thinking about wearables and so on. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Um, that's your word, that's your um, okay, I've got ten minutes to deliver a one hour old, one and a half hour talk, so I'm going to talk relatively quickly. Um, I've got quite a few slides, but there's a, an email address at the end if you'd like a copy of some of those slides, please. Let me know. And we'll also give you again the download uh, URL so you can get papers that Phil was talking about. Mobile learning uh, is a fascinating area, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about that, but also one to one learning, which is uh, the, the, kind of the next stage along. It's kind of a, a subgroup or a, a supergroup, I'm not sure. Um, first of all, uh, more. Mobile assistive learning means using phones or portable devices. Bring your own device, whatever, in the classroom. Uh, in and out of the classroom, you get learning better access. So the one-to-one -one movement, which was started by the large techo technology companies, so uh, David Gravel was just talking about the plot, the conspiracy of corporations to get involved here. Perhaps that's uh, part of it. But using one-to-one, -one, meaning every student in the class has their own personal device, preferably a tablet, or a small laptop, which they then take home with them, not a computer lab that belongs to the school, uh, changes the dynamic, changes what happens in the class, but also before the class and after the class. And it's about equity and access. Equity, hence the, the subtitle of our talk, democratizing access, allowing everybody to have access to knowledge, to have different kinds of activities and exercises, uh, and different educational underpinning, because the, the students have a device which is always with them. And it may not be a phone, a small screen, which is a bit constraining. It will probably, in the next year or two, it will be a tablet. I, I guess by 2020, pretty much every kid in every classroom, in every school, in every country, will be sitting there with a tablet, and everybody will have a tablet connected to the teacher at the front of the room. The connectivity that makes that work is still a bit difficult, so that's a big question mark, a big issue, which is very context sensitive. Uh, but we can also talk about solar power and WiMAX and satellite Wi-Fi and other ways to go around that. And interestingly, many developing countries are much better served than many of the developed countries. Rwanda has fiber optic cable to every every town in the country, for example. Um, uh, it, for me, mobile assistive learning is part of a change of putting the, the learner at the center of the learning system, uh, right in the heart of the modeling of how learning in general and language learning in particular takes place. And it's the learner who is the center of individualized learning, personalized learning, adaptive learning, and learning oriented assessment. All of the all of the trends that move towards being learner-centered, student-centered in our forms of teaching, our methodology, our <coughs> curriculum development. But now we add the device. The learner always has a device. How does that change our classroom management? How does it change our curriculum? How does it change the flipped classroom? Can we do more work before the class and after the class so that we can increase, most important part of mobile learning from my perspective, we can increase the time on task. 
Most people around the world, 1.5 million people learning English right now, most of them are doing two hours a week. You cannot learn English to any sensible level of two hours a week in a secondary school. You have to spend more time being exposed to English, practicing English, listening to English, watching videos. That's why we need the crisis. That's what this is really about in my view. But it means that we have to rearrange our mental set on pedagogies through different kinds of pedagogical models, whether group-oriented learning, self-access learning, informal learning, uh, formal learning. So we need to you know, rearrange and, and stop trying to say that there's one way of teaching, that there's one kind of methodology. There are many, and the methodological structures will fit what we need in a particular context for particular people at particular times. But let's be a little bit less dogmatic about this. That's really important. We are quite a dogmatic profession, I find. Um, so we need new models for the classroom you all know about. We need the overlap of one-to-one -one mobile, tablet, everything that gives the student more equitable access to knowledge and the, the means to reinforce the knowledge that they're doing in the classroom. Remember, it doesn't replace anything, it doesn't replace teachers, it enhances, it reinforces. And in some countries, like this little photo down at the bottom, in some places like in Africa where there's not even electricity, we can still do this. This is a fantastic project, the Aptos project, where uh, using solar power and uh, Wi-Fi, we can do things out in the countryside. Um, Google Aptos, you find out very interesting things that are being done in India and Africa. For me, the most important thing I'll say is time on task, and that means uh, changing our classroom structure. What we do in class, out of class, we shouldn't be having 30 secondary school students in front of us, or even 15 in a language school, all reading the same text at the same time, at the same speed, and then answering questions. If you want to do text study, do it outside the class, put it on the phone, put it on the tablet, talk about it in the class, use the class, use the teacher as a communicative device. That's right. Teachers, we're communicative devices. <laughs> now, one-to-one um, -one is becoming very popular all over the world. 38% of K-12 teachers in the United States uh, say in a recent survey that they're using one-to-one -one, uh, classroom structures. Um, you can't teach uh, everything. You can't learn languages just by using your tablet or your mobile device. You can do some things, and you cannot do other things. It's an enhancement. We mustn't pretend this is a, a replacement, this is a, something totally brand new, um, a brand new approach to language learning. It's, it's a yet another tool to help us to provide better access, um, more time on task, and hopefully, therefore, better outcomes. One of the things that it helps us to do is better classroom management. The idea that we can divide students into groups, into pairs, into, into threes or fours, but the teacher can see what's on everybody's tablet screen, and she can rearrange people so that uh, these two people do one activity, those three people do a different activity, and she can see from her own tablet as she goes around the room facilitating, she can see what everybody's looking at, she can switch off the Facebook access, she can switch off email access, very important. Uh, this kind of classroom management software is now becoming very sophisticated, uh, really exciting stuff that we can look at uh, there. Some, uh, some projects around the world are taking this really to the max. The most technologically advanced country in the world is Uruguay. In Uruguay, which is a small country, so it's easier to do big projects, they've given a mobile device to every child in the country. Every child is no more than 300 meters from a free, totally free, Wi-Fi hotspot. Everybody uses them to learn English in the class, and they also use, in the screen here, because they haven't got enough English teachers, they use remote teachers who are beamed in by video conference to then help the kids uh, decide what to do on their laptops and give them activities after the class and so on. A really interesting, different kind of model. Now, every context in every country around the world will have a different uh, approach to how we build in technology. So remote teaching might be helpful, um, device teaching might be the best way to do that. Um, none of this works without policy, without governments buying into it, without governments taking the right policy decisions, and we as teachers have to influence policy. We mustn't pretend that that's a different department. We have to influence it. And there are different areas there, especially on the right-hand side, the investment. This is the thing that causes most of the problems in education around the world. The ministries invest money in buying lots of equipment, for example, but don't invest money in training the teachers and don't invest money in developing new curriculum 
do software, do content, something interesting. So my rule is the rule of thirds. No more than a third of the budget on equipment and hardware and computer labs, tablets, whatever you, you, you wish. At least a third on teacher development and training so teachers can really get into how we make the, the most benefit out of this. There are some other policy checklists there, strategic things that we need to help ministries of education and uh, decision makers work on. Uh, we also have to retrain ourselves and our colleagues in digital teaching, digital teacher competencies. Here's some examples of them here. There are quite a few courses around now, and Nicky Hockey from Barcelona is running one as well. Great quote on the right-hand side from Turkey where they're doing a lot of work on tablets. They've just bought 10 million tablets for um, secondary schools. So they know uh, what the challenges are. <coughs> if you don't train the teachers, your investment will lose all of its purpose. And there are many horror stories like that. But these, these are the kinds of new uh, pedagogical competencies that teachers will need to take on board and be open-minded and be happy to learn something new and to try something new and to motivate their students and to give them better time on task. In Cambridge, we're even taking this a stage further because we're very, very research focused. We've developed a research institute that's doing computer-based, uh, tablet-based testing, you can see in the photo there, but also computer-based computer grading of uh, test and examination, including computer-based grading of speech. That's a whole other presentation, another day. <laughs> uh, finally, this is not going to stop, as Phil just said. This is going to continue. Um, in the future, you all know the reference to the Babel fish and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You put a fish in your ear and he translates everything that people say to you. We already have speech to speech translation. It's called Google Translate. It's on your phone. It's free. It works. I've tried it with my mother in law and it works. <laughs> I speak English to my phone and press a button. It speaks Russian to her. She speaks Russian to it. I take the phone back. It speaks, not writes, speaks English to me. It works. If this works, and it gets more sophisticated, how will this change our jobs? It will take away our jobs, but it will change our jobs. We have to be open-minded and work about and work out how we're going to do that. The watches, the Samsung watch on the top right, that already has Google Translate built into it. So you can speak to your watch, and it speaks in Russian. <laughs> how does that change things? Google Glass, you all know the experiments that are going on there. Uh, so, the world is exciting, new things are going to happen. Let's make sure our students have uh, access to knowledge and to new ideas, and they have lots of opportunity to improve their language uh, using the new technology. <coughs> the flexible screen there, that's going to be one of the most exciting things. The little, um, see the sailboat there? What's, what that is going to be, if you buy a phone, it's about that big, and then you have a little tab here, and you pull, and the screen comes out, and you have a tablet. <laughs> and then when you finish using it, you let go, and it rolls back up again, and then you pop it. That's the next thing. Um, just to remind you about the papers, you can get all of the TERF papers from turfonline.org. There's the list of them. Uh, that's my email if you want to send any rude comments, or <laughs> copies of any slides, or pictures. And I look forward to the discussion. We're, we're going through this quickly because we want a lot of discussion with you and from you in the second half. Thanks very much. Morning, everyone. Um, I, I like the conspiracy theories of corporations as well, and I, I see them all as an opportunity of us meeting the corporations to be able to bring more individualized, personal roadmaps for our for our students. I have to thank David Brand as well for having at least two advertisements about Brazil in this session, which makes my job a little bit easier. So I'm, I'm now going to give examples of what is actually happening uh, in some of Brazil's a country, and uh, also in public and, and private schools. So we have the challenge of being the fifth largest country in the world with very diverse income and, and living conditions, which um, makes it very, very difficult for funding everything we need to do, which means that students in Brazil don't have an equal access to um, quality education. And if you look at our general marks in the PISA ranking, we're the 58th out of 65 countries, which means that the government is more interested in improving maths and Portuguese than actually English, although I must say that our new president Dilma 
uh, with her Science Without Borders, um, Kian Green, has made as good English back to the map in Brazil. Teaching is a very low status profession. For you to have an idea, the initial salary of a teacher in Brazil in public education is $1,000 in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, and that is 44% above the national average. <coughs> Uh, so therefore, it's a very low attractivity. And most of our teachers in public schools, they're under the B1 level. So that makes teaching English a challenge. Um, I'm, going to, so I'm going to show you what's, what the government is doing with uh, mobile learning. And then I'm going to take you through um, what my own organization is doing and then talk a little bit about the future. So, what are our barriers? Well, first of all, we have a very uneven access to broadband in Brazil. And it's much better in the urban areas, but we have areas where it's extremely difficult to, to get good access. And our speed is low. It's 2.4 compared to megabytes bits per second compared to 3.6 in Mexico and here in the United States at 8.7. Also, we have one of the most expensive telecommunication services in the world, partially due to high taxes. And it also has the highest rate of complaints. I mean, I personally write to a site called Hekamia Key, which means complain here, <laughs> about the service I get, never mind uh, you know, what happens in less privileged homes. The other thing is in terms of teaching, we're a country where the learning environment is very teacher-led and print-dependent, which means that the transfer for technology is quite challenging for the teachers. And also, uh, our curriculum rarely considers real-world needs. In terms of the public system, we have insufficient funding. And um, you, you probably find in the southeast of Brazil, we have better funding, but there are some areas which have very, very poor funding. And the critical, the situation of teachers is very critical. So for example, if you're earning $1,000 a month, how can you buy a computer for your own personal use to experiment at home? Um, you have challenging working conditions. We don't have uh, Wi-Fi in all the schools, very low tech in general. We have teacher resistance to change, and we have a gap in competences. Um, there's very little teacher training, never mind teacher training in technology. And apart from all that, there's a lack of relevant uh, content, especially in, in language learning. And one of the things I think we forget sometimes is the preparation of leadership and leadership as champions of new ideas. And this is something that I think we need to work on in Brazil. So, different to Turkey, uh, the Brazilian government in, in 2011 announced that they would distribute 600,000 tablets. This is not for students, this is for teachers. And they were going to do this in 2012. It actually happened in 2013 and 2014. Now, it's not important to know how much the real is worth. If you look at the proportion, the government invested 180 million reais on tablets, 73 million for digital content, compared to 1 billion for books. And training, I couldn't find a single statistic to back me up. So it's not surprising that you get comments like this from a head of a school in the state of Pernambuco, um, highly criticizing the government's lack of planning. And she said, we understand how the tablet worked when it arrived at the school. So it's sort of a press button system. Now, in Sao Paulo, the tablet distribution has covered 25% of the teachers. Now, of this 25%, of this only 50% are using the tablets because they distributed tagged to a teacher, tagged to a subject. So the teacher transferred to school, you know, the tablet stayed in the the stop room. And it was sent mainly to high schools in urban areas and restricted to subjects like exact sciences and biology. Apart from that, teachers only have one orientation session per bimester. And the amazing thing, teachers of English didn't receive a tablet. So, all schools in Sao Paulo nowadays have a multimedia kit. That's the old-fashioned trolley that you roll from classroom to classroom. And today, in 2014, 10% of the schools are being equipped as interactive, and they can choose whether they want to do 5, 10, 15, or 20 classrooms. 
um, for this for this project. The subject matter comes from Khan Academy, the Lehman Foundation in Sao Paulo translated uh, the Khan Academy subjects, and there is a teacher's portal. But once again, there's nothing in English. But it's a land of opportunity. Brazil has 1.3 mobiles per capita, uh, lower than Russia 1.8, but still high. 85% of our mobiles are Android. And um, according to the uh, Bordel Foundation in Sao Paulo, the smartphone with Android has become the poor man's computer. Um, this, is, this is something very important. So mobile has significant importance in democratizing access in Brazil. Apart from that, Brazilians love Facebook. We're the second largest market for Facebook in, in the world. So this is an opportunity uh, for us. But we have drivers, so we have hope for the future. And one of the biggest drivers um, of the increase of annex of access and speed to broadband is actually the, the games, the major sporting events that we're having. And you have the needs of the whole city. So of course the 12 whole cities are getting the majority of budgets uh, spent. And this is for the World Cup, which is going to happen, as most of you here probably know, on the 12th of June, and the country is very excited about that. You know? So apart from the World Cup has, has, has helped this increase of access, but apart from that, there is some cost efficiency. Prices are coming down slowly, but they are coming down, and we are getting higher speeds, a lot really driven by business, the, the needs for business in Brazil. So where do our opportunities come from? I think our opportunities actually come from our learners themselves, and they're very proficient. If you go into a Brazilian university, you will find at least 100 mobiles on the teacher's table. So what happens is the classes are recorded, and in large towns like Sao Paulo and Rio, in the long commutes to work, which sometimes take people two to three hours, they listen to the lectures again. It's a new way of uh, studying and revising. Students, whether the teacher likes it or not, the, the students are taking pictures, photos of their homework and flip charts. They are downloading texts and presentations, and they are using WhatsApp for sharing knowledge with colleagues, apart from watching video and streaming. So it's my belief that it's this rich experience that students are having with internet that will push uh, school activity ahead. The teacher will have to change. Another interesting thing about Brazil is the creativity. So what people do, because access to, to Wi-Fi is expensive, neighbors get together and share. So one neighbor pays the bill, and then is divided with uh, other neighbors. We also have uh, cheap access in land houses, libraries, etc. Uh, I'd now look, like to look at the richer side of, of Brazil, and here I'm going to talk about the private um, language providers, uh, like the school that I work at and others. Uh, we have interactive whiteboards in all the classrooms, we have multimedia centers, desktops, laptops, but mobile devices are still not taken up well by teachers. I would say that no more than 5 or 10 percent of our teachers are actually using mobile devices. I'm going to have to speed up here. Um, I'm going to skip Hakel's class because it's a minute. I've only got three minutes. So I think, Ryan, this will be available uh, later on the TERS site. But the interesting thing about this class is we show the use by a blind student as well uh, through audio. So basically, what are the opportunities we see from the research of TERF? Uh, one thing that providers should think of is a more intensive use of personal roadmaps. And that means us looking into learning analytics, because through learning analytics, we can work out special um, paths for each student. Um, we must take into consideration as well the, the variety of operating systems that are brought to the classroom, and also the need for incorporating social networking tools. Uh, which will give access to more open learning sites. Um, as mentioned before, there has to be a review of classroom practice, uh, into, and MOL is a good opportunity for looking at different ways that students like to learn and their pace of learning, and also 
looking at students as co-authors of the learning experience that they can bring, what they think is meaningful for them into the classroom, and also being able to learn wherever, whenever, and with, with whoever, whichever peer that they would like to. <coughs> in terms of our teachers, we have to encourage them to use mobile devices more to experiment, and looking at what these devices can actually afford or where it limits and not transfer, again, past repertoire. We have to build confidence and competence with our teachers and show them how they can transfer the student skills which are probably higher developed than um, the actual teachers into the classroom. And also we have to understand better digital literacy. So the challenges for teach uh, development programs, which is something that uh, Michael Carey brought up and I believe and I think this is the heart of the matter, we need more familiarization with the tools and I'm glad to see that there are courses available for now, if not in Brazil, at least elsewhere. And we have to teach teachers how to design relevant uh, content, activities and skills and not just depend on um, what they think of all of a sudden, it has to be something logical. Basically, I think that more should be embedded in the learning vision and this will help make it make more sense. Other challenges I see are use limits and risks of social networking, what is pasted on Facebook, who can become liable. Um, we're having difficulty trying to uh, get our teachers to understand what is suitable, what isn't suitable for this sort of sharing. We have to rethink the learning process to leverage more informal uh, knowledge. And I hope that we get beyond the stage in the mobile of exposure to actually a larger use of perhaps language learning as a, as a solution. So, in Brazil, the distribution of the hardware preceded the very critical planning phase. So our politicians and education leaders, they have to redefine the strategy for use of curriculum and technology, thinking about the needs of students and employers. And here I liked um, the explore, sustain, and renew phrase of TESOL here, because I think these are three verbs that refer to more. To move to a student-centered learning is a huge challenge for us in Brazil. And for this, teacher development programs are needed. So, in conclusion, mobiles in education will be a natural growth. The uh, Brazilian phone carriers already have managed courses and I think more people will be attracted to this market. Free and low cost apps are certainly very important for the future in the classroom and our increase of broadband will allow us more access to open content. So for Brazil I would say that in 2014 it's an aspiration I was counting 2014 plus the five years we'll get within the 2020 that Michael said that we hope to have not only a, a tablet for every teacher but also a tablet for every student in Brazil. But I really believe that for it to be successful we depend on the, the teacher uh, and teacher training so that the mobile devices are used properly. For me, that is really the heart of the matter and the missing piece of the puzzle. Good morning. To complete the conspiracy part of the program, of course, you have to have the U.S. government participate, right? <laughs> That's what. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Um, the obviously I'm technologically challenged as well. The U.S. State Department, um, our English language programming for years have focused on teacher training, and I think many of you are are familiar with our English language fellows and, and other programs that we participate in overseas. Over the past recent future, we've been trying to look at ways to get content and engage with students directly. This is by no means to replace 
um, our teacher um, focus. Many of the colleagues here speaking about the importance of the teacher. In no way are we looking or saying that that isn't necessary. But with the demand of English being at the level that it is, we are focused on how do we reach, um, increase our reach, if not our depth of engagement um, with students around the world. One of the things that became very clear to us in our areas of working where the majority are in um, resource, less resourced environments, was the fact that while smartphones are everywhere, non-smartphones are even more prolific. So how can we get our content um, on these um, what, uh, three, 2G networks um, of the billions of people out there that are, that are using them? Roughly 75% of the world's population, Feature phones make up more than 80% of the, of the market. How can we get to this to this market? And the way that we decided to do it was in a um, partnership under our English Education Alliance with Bino, which is an Australian technology company and world reader, um, to use a new technology of data compression that would reduce the access cost for our material to get on these feature phones and Android devices. Um, what I would like to try to do here is talk through For here. This is an actual phone being used at the speed that it would be used. So what we did is offer um, our, in a partnership with World Reader, about 50 publications that we have available, um, including graded readers and books on American culture, resources for teachers, and they can be downloaded one chapter at a time. And this will show you the speed at which you can actually do it, we've had about 100,000 unique um, read. We've had about 100,000 unique readers and over 2 million pages downloaded with the majority of them being in um, Africa and South Asia. We can do our audiobooks, we can, which have had over 400,000 downloads. Um, we can do music. This one here is our word soup, which is part of our trace video game, um, which will show you, um, you know, we've had over 4 million times played with 1.3 million unique users since um, October 2002. This kind of shows you the speed at which it works. Probably wouldn't work for your 15-year-old, but for uh, a 12-year-old in uh, Botswana, it's considered to be really cool. Um, but it also gives them uh, a lot of access to other uh, material through our, um, through our partnership with World Reader, VOA, a dictionary, Google Translate, Facebook, YouTube. There's many more opportunities here that we're looking to take advantage of that it's content driven. Um, having found the platform, what we're looking for is how to get the content um, out there for students and for uh, for teachers, students to use um, with, the, with the idea being, how can we get to them on the devices they're already using? We went through um, a very expensive process of realizing that providing them the devices overseas is probably the not the best way to go. They've got the devices, let's figure out the way to get the content to them including things such as quizzes, which can be uh, created and translated, the instructions translated into their own languages, and then um, having them take the quizzes and our ability to look at the data and see um, what's being done. Um, another aspect for a teacher that might be useful um, in a classroom 
Um, so what it is basically is that our partner provides the, the free platform and uh, everything from educational content to games, but there's there's an area of social media, other other aspects of this that we are looking to explore and um, make better use of. Um, Finder, like I said, is an Australian company with over 5 million mobile users. Um, I don't really understand the technology in which I have Mr. Baidu here to explain it to you in a much more coherent fashion. Um, but through the compression of the data processing, you, it costs about 10 times, you get 10 times less data used to do the same thing um, on Java-enabled feature phones and Android devices. Um, and it can support up to 18 different languages. Um, I got some information here on how you can download the device, try it on your own mobile phone. I happen to have a mobile phone that's 2G, so I actually use the technology. Um, but I think the um, the important thing that we've been that we've been looking at is um, how to drive the content that's useful. And the other part of it that I will, that we'll be looking for in the future is how to make it useful for a teacher, how to train a teacher to use it in the classroom and engage. When we had a group that went out to Africa and, and uh, of our regional English language officers and talked to the students, we, we came into some aha kind of moments. You still need a data plan in order to participate in this. Um, it's a, a level above the MSF, MSS kind of, you know, just chatting back and forth. And there were students that that was, uh, that was withdrawn, you know, that was um, uh, impediment to their participating. So a teacher might be able to bring the device into a classroom and use it. She might be able to afford the data plan. The students, you know, that might be that might be uh, might be an issue. And the other thing we ran into, which I don't think is any surprise, is the teachers didn't know what to do with this. Um, and transferring the knowledge that the students had of playing on Facebook or doing video games with. Um, how to use it for learning. That's not a, just an assumption that perhaps was made of, well, they know how to do Facebook, they're going to know how to take a quiz or, or use this device uh, for, for the language learning. Um, so I think in the future what we'll be doing is using this for um, trying to find out ways of using this for teachers and then trying to get teachers comfortable. Because at the end of the day, even though we are very anxious to increase our access and reach more students, we understand that the impact to uh, sustained language learning, the key is the interface between the teacher and the student. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's just here, it's something we do. On the other hand, um, 
if you're in a city like Karachi or the university like Herat University in northwestern Afghanistan, none of those three things can be taken for granted uh, at all. In terms of the power and power consumption, how many of you are familiar with the term load shedding? How many have not heard this before? For those of you who have not heard it, it sounds pretty good because what's a load? It's a burden. It's something heavy. And what is shed? It means to get rid of. So it sounds like you're getting rid of a load. It's something kind of nice. The problem is when it means um, a euphemism for uh, power outage and power cuts. And so in certain parts of the world that I've been working in, you'll have load shedding for up to 16 hours a day. That means power outage for 16 hours. It doesn't mean they're relieving you of a, hurt, of a heavy burden. No, they're giving you a heavy burden while you're load shedding. What's the solution? A generator. In fact, two generators. And I've been to universities and, and schools in, in South Asia and the Middle East that have two generators to be safe. What's the problem with the generator? You start it up, but, 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 okay, the computers are humming, but, 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 mm. <coughs> Fuel. Who's got the fuel? Where's the fuel can? Who has the key to the shed that has the fuel can? Who has the budget to buy the fuel that goes in the can in the shed that has the fuel can? The key to the guy that has it. It's endless. And these things are a real problem. That's why mobile devices that can be charged when there is power and run when there's not power are really a sign of the future. I think a saving grace for many of these countries. We take bandwidth. We complain if there's no 4G. Oh, gosh, there's no 4G. You know? Well, the world is running on 2G, folks. And I think Marty's project is brilliant, taking advantage of the majority of the technology that's out there. The statistics were quite remarkable. We live by smartphones, but most of the world uh, doesn't. <coughs> and the delivery. We're getting it delivered right here in this big room. In the old days, a building of this size would have blocked out the sun uh, would have blocked out the signal and we'd all be running out through the windows. What are those old days? Maybe not last convention, but the one before, two before, three before. Uh, how long has it been that you could have free Wi-Fi in any room in any convention center? And yet, we take it for granted now. <clears throat> Broadband is coming to places and, and places I've been working in, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, different South Asian countries. International projects are bringing in the, the servers have been proudly shown, the server banks have been uh, uh, introduced to the, uh, the high bandwidth the speeds in, in the computer center. I've looked out the window and seen students right outside with laptops. I thought, that's pretty cool. And the guy says, you know why they're standing there with their laptops? Because we have a small, uh, we managed to get a, a Wi-Fi point here. But you see that building 100 yards away, we don't have the funds to run fiber optic from the server to all the faculties, to the departments, to the colleges and the university. So the only place that it's available now is in the vicinity of the building where the servers are. And all the rest of the universities yet to be wired, although they have a very high-tech satellite dish on the roof pulling in a European-sponsored signal. So things we take for granted are not um, <coughs> universally <coughs> available to all of our, our colleagues. Okay, in spite of it all, there are success stories. And I think Marty and, and others have, have shown uh, some of them. Here's an example from a conversation with a professor in South Asia who bought a smartphone three years ago. He was living in a metropolitan area. Um, as he was exploring the phone, he discovered apps. He stumbled onto a dictionary. And then he found other things that he thought he could use for language teaching. <coughs> Can you read that in the back, or should I read it out loud for you? It's a, it's a quote from, from uh, the professor. All right? We can read it. You can read it, okay. So take a look at that. And you'll see, and these are screenshots that he kind of provided for me, too. Um, phonetic chart <coughs> over here, a rainbow, and it's one of these little apps that you can go both ways to learn the phonetic alphabet. <coughs> He's lucky because almost half of his students use Android mobile phones so they can get the, the apps. So he expanded the repertoire and he found apps for sounds, conversation, writing skills. The IELTS and TOEFL prep have all kinds of apps covering all kinds of skills 
and he was just in, in heaven as he discovered all this. He used group work because about half his class had smartphones, so he put them with those who don't, and that maximized use and access. <coughs> and he tried to encourage them to use their phones and these apps outside of class and at home, and he said some, he used the word some, some of them do use these applications when they are out of school. Because most of them still think of phones as the primary or what came in as a primary use, which is a communication device. Uh, texting, uh, probably most of the time, and calling from time to time. And I just love it when he said, few realize that mobile is no longer just a device for communication, but rather a full computer for many uses. This goes back to what my colleagues were saying. It's basically a computer in your pocket. Um, I don't know the statistics, but you know that quote about the computer that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon is so many times less. I mean, the mobile phones in our pocket is so many times more powerful than, than the moonshot. Um, it, 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 it's just amazing, really. Anyway, he's raising an issue here that we're going to, uh, to come to. And that is, challenges are not only in terms of hard, hardware, power, bandwidth, delivery, but also in attitudes toward learning. What is learning? For lots of students around the world, learning is having a teacher give you a lecture. And I talked to a graduate student uh, from the South Asian country and one of our programs at a U.S. university who was put into a graduate seminar, six students and a, and a professor. She came back to her supervisor and said, I want to transfer out. I have, I'm not learning anything. The professor has not delivered a single lecture in the three weeks I've been here. That's the difference in, in, in paradigms of what is learning. Teachers need to be oriented, and my colleague there highlighted in his quote below, however, most of the teachers and students are not aware of these apps. The need is to introduce and provide teachers training um, in order to use them. So, in spite of all the challenges and the things that my colleagues have addressed, and some of these things that we take for granted in terms of power, bandwidth, delivery, teaching, learning, attitudes, I think there really is a way forward. I think it's unstoppable, as was kind of mentioned uh, before. And it's up to us, I think, to really encourage the teachers to take the lead. The teachers have to be users, have to be proficient, have to know, have to understand, and be champions of, of mobile technology. Because the students will follow that lead, and they, they will embrace it. Um, and as they do so, going forward, sort of uh, one click at a time. <clears throat> OK, so that brings us to the conclusion of our, our short set of presentations. And we've got done quite well. We really wanted to use half the time for presentations and half the time for a fair amount of, of interaction. So before we move into that, I do want to just make a couple of Members are, are here and ready. And anybody who has questions? Yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Well, I'll, I've been researching this a lot, actually. I'm a physics language institute. And all our students have iPads, and it's part of my job to figure out how to vet these, get the teachers involved. And a lot of the research I've been reading, there was one statement that was made about you can learn from the device. And there are those who feel that that statement might need to qualify more because a device can't actually teach you. I think it goes back to some of the comments about we need to know what the device can do, what criteria it aligns to, and it's more an enhancement to learning than actually the device being the learning medium. Can, 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 can you hear the question? Should we rephrase? The question is on the. Uh, the, 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 the sentence, you can learn from the device. Can the device actually teach and students learn, or is it something for enhancing? Is that a, well, uh, it's, it's more getting into the aspect of the learning. So if you just give me an iPhone and you say, okay, you're going to learn from this device, it's really the device, I think, needs to be separated from the actual learning that's happening. And I, I, I don't know what your thoughts might be on that. Has, and and I, I apologize if it's, if it's not appropriate, because I'm not an English language expert. Would you pick up a book and say that this book is teaching me something? Or would you look at it as this book is a device that I use in my learning process? Is there a difference just inherently between this book 
and this device. I think with what's been going on, yes, because I think that device gives you a lot more functionality than the book. You're, I agree with you because the book can. I think you can. It can be both. The, you are learning from the book, but it's the selection of the book and the content that is the relevancy. I think there, and I can't now send you notes and things that I can do with Evernote. I can upload a PDF note it and then send it off to you to see what are your comments, let's collaborate. So I think, yes, there is a difference in that sense that we're moving into this realm of one device meeting many functionalities. But is it indeed the, um, you know, it's, it's linking me to content and I have to have an app there. I'll give you an example. A lot of what I do, I call it a cognition app because I have to find apps for all the specific languages we are teaching so that they can be uploaded into the apps and maybe go with the deployment or something like that. So then, yes, then I'm learning from that. But is it the device or now it's um, the actual app that's been created that can be accessed through the device? Yeah. So I think that's what we're getting into. I, I hear this, uh, this uh, question quite often, and I think, uh, I think people get too hung up on this. It, this is really not, uh, with, with respect, no. it's not really the point. Because we learn from doing things. We learn from reading, we learn from listening, we learn from doing an acti a grammar activity, we, do, we learn from taking a photo and telling a story to another student, we learn from listening to the teacher, we learn from doing, from the in forms of the word. <coughs> Christ does is it is it gives us more opportunity to do it to do stuff. It gives us stuff to read. It gives us stuff to listen to. It gives us stuff to look at. It provides us with an activity to do something with. It provides us with an interaction. The device is just a tool. So we're not learning from a machine. We are learning in the same way that we normally learn from a teacher. But because the teacher's not there, or we haven't got one teacher per person, this is providing extra kinds of input. So. I think we worry about that far too much. Nobody learns from a machine. They learn by doing things, but the machine is a great mediator of content, activity, uh, and knowledge. Um, I, I simply want to respond to this by saying that in countries where the mode so far has been teacher-fronted, for one thing, this changes the stats from teacher fronted to student engagement, as you can see from there. Now that in itself is a big step <coughs> for countries where rote learning, I don't know if you know this term, which means regurgitating yes. what you have learned. Yes. Where <coughs> what teacher tells you, re you regurgitate, and that's learning. If that has been the stance so far, then this kind of thing sort of moves away from it completely mm -hmm. and puts you into the learner's court. Exactly. Now that exact that is the main point. It doesn't matter what else, like you're saying. I mean, you're doing the ink things, and that's it. You're doing the ink thing. Yeah. And it may be in a context. It may be in a context where, in the United States, we've gone towards the student-centered learning over a period of time, and just as many of these countries are skipping the technological, you know, you do this on a desktop, you do it here, they're skipping that stage of getting to the student-centeredness. And that cultural discussion is disruptive and it's going to take some time uh, to work through. Yeah, there's a gentleman here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really considered that net insertion technology is the, that's the solution for improving the learning and teaching process. Because uh, uh, the all of this type of mobile devices or it's smartphones or this type of technology, doesn't change really the learning process. Is they are resources. They are simply resources as the book is, as a supplementary material written resources. But if we keep trying, if we keep um, teaching traditionally, but even though using technology, we have gained, I mean, we've gained nothing, definitely. So it means that met the methodology is the part that we have to consider really deeply, and in a way, how motivated students to be hooked, okay, to different topics. As you said, we learn by doing. Okay, definitely. If we want to learn how to write, the students have need to do, need, need writing. And if we need to learn how to do listening, students need to listen. Um, I got a, a kind of a bit experience working with this type of uh, technology uh, in my classes at uh, Kindy University, where students, well, most of the students have the smart, the smartphone in class, and they are really um, curious about using the, the cell phone number all the time, or kids just were texting. 
when I see that, I realize that the students want to reuse uh, technology. I simply ask them to take out, I mean, to take out uh, the cell phones. Uh, give them some examples of uh, some links and ask them to do certain exercises, mm -hmm. okay, via, I mean, via Wi-Fi. And they really like it because they work according to their needs and interests, okay. So, um, I really have fun with, the, with my students. And also, sometimes when I find multi skilled students in my own classes, because there are all the time, okay, I simply assign different type of advice, ask them to look for different links, or just give them a topic, for example, okay, and I say, well, try to look for any type of a link that will match this topic according to your needs. So students work with different topics, different links in the same, at the same moment, but they are learning. Okay. They are definitely learning. And they are in control of that topic. Sure, so definitely. Control. The lady there. Uh, yeah. One, one interesting thing, I think in the U.S. we are a little bit um, taken by our own rhetoric, disruptive learning and student interest, and if you've taught long enough, you're less romantic about students <laughs> knowing, you know, what they they need. And, but one area that um, I've, I've seen field tested in the in um, urban schools in the U.S., in rural schools in South Africa, now in China, is adaptive learning, where the mobile device allows you to deliver the same rich content with affordances that make the weakest student and the strongest student able to access it. Yeah. For example, there's a, um, there are applications in which you can low dictionary. Zo Reader is the best one for China. So students can read in English, but every time they have trouble with a word, they click on it, get a Chinese translation, and get it saved to their dictionary. You can have simplified English version of a short story and the full version. You can have a completely bilingual or non-bilingual. And then you've got the con the rich content is the same. The teacher Teacher isn't having to write IEPs mm -hmm. for every different student, um, and it's private. If some students have to hear the audio because they can't read, it's not something that that segregates them. So that isn't individualized learning by interest. It's saying there are no excuses now, and you all can do this now. Yeah. So I think that's something that I think deserves some more research and experimentation across different settings. Uh, yes, um, this is for Marty. Um, I, I'm actually one of your English language specialists, and what I'm finding, I'm developing something in Armenia right now, and um, because students have more access to the internet, there, um, there's a lot more emphasis on having what you do be current in terms of both content and format. And one of the things I'm running into is a lot of the already, you mentioned uh, uh, ways to get the content out there that's already in the State Department um, resource centers. A lot of it's dated, and students are much more um, critical of that now than they used to be when they were just grateful for any movie, for mm -hmm. example. Be, and so I want to know what the State Department has in terms of a plan to constantly update what's already there and replace the data with more current because it's it's really a demanding audience out there and um, especially when you're working in places where they have a lot of access to what is currently being produced in the United States. My plan is I'm bringing David Fay in as our material witness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is a... Um, it is a very challenging question. Right. Um, we have traditionally put a lot of resources into material development. And we've come up with some pretty cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But the reality is there's a lot of commercially produced material out there. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar industry that my extremely talented team is not going to be able to replicate on the extremely small budget yeah. I give them to be able to do. So it's trying to figure out the most efficient way to curate what's out there. There's a lot of free material, um, but it's time consuming to kind of go through it and pick out the stuff that's what I'm doing that, right now. <laughs> that's, so we uh, bring in specialists yeah. to do it for us. Um, 
So that that is a that is a challenge that we're looking at on the on the material mm -hmm. side. We have there, there are two sides of it to the platform and the content. While many people are always are, are very intent on the device or the platform, um, uh, I congratulate my team because they're always much more focused on the content. Mm -hmm. What are we going to actually put in front of the students and the teachers? And it's it's a challenging question because the demand is so high and so shifting. Um, Too much. Yeah, I guess in a, in, a, in a word, they're asking for authentic material, and by authentic, they mean current as Can well. Brian, um, I was just pointing out that we take the next question, which generally wants to hear. Yeah. I just had a comment on that. that since that we have a tendency to always top-down design content. Uh, if you look at YouTube, you look at uh, how a lot of the, the internet companies that really move forward are designing and curating content. They're crowdsourcing the effort. Wikipedia was a crowdsourced effort. Uh, it was designed by everybody. The idea there's there's hundreds of thousands of those teachers who are going out and finding the best TED Talks and the best YouTube videos. What we lack is a website that allows us to, to socially rank yes. that content up, <laughs> to socially tag that content by grade level. And, and it could be a crowdsourced effort. You're, you and your team wouldn't necessarily have to pick the content. We could all pick the content. What we need is a platform that's a social platform that allows all of us to rank it in a way that's usable and, and, and yeah. fairly done. Yeah. Like a, te a teacher's version of Reddit. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I, can I comment? Because I think I disagree. Because I, it, it sounds great, and we should be doing that as well, but you're forgetting the fact that the vast majority of learners on the planet Earth are A1 or A2 level. They couldn't understand a word of any of the things that you just described. Yeah. Right. They couldn't understand it. The teachers wouldn't understand it, right? Because it's got to be at the level of English that people can actually understand and then process and then learn from and then replicate as they go through their learning journey from very, very low level elementary and beginner level. The vast majority of people, there are 1.5 billion people learning English, there are 12 and a half to 13 million teachers of English. The vast majority of them are at elementary level. Yes. They but, can't understand yes. TED Talks. So that's an important thing to do, but that's why we also need curriculum development, the, the, the stuff that's specially written, specially designed for learners, which is what uh, uh, Marty's teams are also looking at. Uh, so we have to balance the two together. No, I understand that, but also the videos on YouTube that are actually, uh, say for example, songs that have been translated and actually dubbed into English, and all the content that's out there that K-12 teachers are using and uploading and putting out there, it's, it's more than just TED Talks. TED, I have to be a college college level instructor, so that I really rated that. There's so much content out there that's free, and it's not only the language learners that would be using this technology. You're talking to a variety of language teachers here, and we're the ones that want access to where it is so we can point our students in the right direction. I mean, I understand the hope of access for students, but the content is too much. There, there's, there's too much for all of us to curate, and if we're all trying to curate and we don't have a, a, a common nexus for that curation, then we're all doing the same work. <coughs> and, and that's that's what I see as a big problem. Yeah. Well, one, of, one of my concerns with um, what's happening in the educational technology industry right now is that the, what's being developed in these companies is often developed by um, technicians, by ed tech people. But the research that we've done and the knowledge that we have as teachers and as educators often isn't. I work for an ed tech company, so I see this happening on a daily basis. What's produced is often not supportive of like project-based learning or something that's a very sophisticated, well-developed theory of learning that you can use. A lot of these um, products and apps that are produced go backwards in, in the education field, actually, and are more kind of behaviorist in, in, their, in their way of working, like read, see, read, respond, do, 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 and it's individual. It's getting away from social learning. It's get away from what, getting away from what we've discovered about group learning and about pair work. And so i just like to see more of that, not that anyone here can necessarily, or maybe we can all do something about that, but I often feel like, they say, T I'm also a teacher, teachers are afraid of technology. I'm not afraid of technology, but I often don't find that the technology supports what I've learned about how to teach in the classroom. Mm -hmm. so. I think one, one uh, the side to that, and I agree with you 100%, and, uh, is that the example that I used uh, from, from South Asia, 
not everybody had a smartphone, therefore it necessitated group and pair collaboration. So there was a social component. So if teachers are clever, they could, they could keep and build in that social uh, component. Um, it, and it doesn't have to go, you know, totally so. But we could do so much more with it. You could build yeah. it right into the technology. It, it should be built into the apps. And yeah. the variety, version A, version B, or whatever, and everybody has a version that they right. have to collaborate. So there's a lot of things that could be done. Yeah. yeah there, is, there is some work on that. Microsoft is working on a special uh, collaboration apps. Mm. Uh, there's a group called the Collaborative Assessment Organization. Um, the Alliance, and they're developing stuff like that. Assessment Organization? Yeah, Collaborative Assessment Alliance, CAA.org. We're doing things like that. It's part of the 21st century skills program. But I, I just want to say, though, that I, I think that you're right, but we mustn't be so zero-sum about this. We mustn't be so binary. In other words, I think it's really good that students can sit alone in their room and do a vocabulary exercise, which is a matching exercise or a multiple choice quiz that they could have done on paper 25 years ago. I think that's also important. It's not zero sum. We need the social stuff, but we also need the individual, quiet, reflective things that you can do by yourself. I think that's both important. Um, I, and I, I agree with what you're saying with that. I think there's room for behaviorism constructivism and all that. But I, I did want to make the plug for the curation of content, and I totally agree, and we do a lot of that. We do a lot of evaluating our text, we have to. And um, we have a great system in place, and we get a number of people who, and I think one of the issues, though, is what is the criteria for your authentic material at these different levels of language? And not all of us are working on one standard. I'm working on the ILR, we've got Common Core, but what I'm finding, we do it a lot to call is the curation, and we have groups there that really, where you can go on, they have online text readers, and the authentic material is so important because it keeps currency with the language, because you know that language is always dynamic and evolving. So I think that's a piece that really needs to be expanded upon, you know, or where we can contribute, and then maybe you'll get more of your authentic materials. I just, I just want to add a comment yeah. to that and go back to yours as well. There is a, a European Union project uh, Cool store. What's which it? C L I L is content and language and okay. learning. Oh, okay. And then yeah. store. Yeah. So yeah. just Google that particular acronym. Yeah. And what they've done is they they have some material they've collected. They've also collected uh, asked teachers to send them yeah. authentic material <laughs> that's graded on the common European framework all the way from A1 up to C2. Right. For those of you who are familiar with that. And they're linked to a whole series of uh, bilingual dictionaries automatically. So that the transcript of these are videos, and the transcript of the video, you can click on any word and get either of an L2, tran yeah, an L2 definition or an L1 translation. And it's a, they really want people to send them more stuff. And so they have begun curating, they have begun uh, tagging, uh, and there's uh, there are a lot of people, smart people behind this who are trying to move it forward, but it's hard to get people to donate. It's one thing to say, it's great if we have this stuff, but it's, teachers are so busy, uh, they're not like a lot of the people who present their uh, information to, I think, the social, uh, you know, to social networks where you'll write a two-page review of a book that you read because you've got the time to do that. Most teachers don't. Take just another, uh, I'll hand up over here, and then maybe in the back, and then uh, we're going to just leave the last few minutes for um, a kind of mix and mingle, uh, because we do want to vacate the room on time, and not let anybody, you know, how does it teach so all? Everybody hates standing outside the door, so we don't want to be one of those groups. <laughs> so uh, time is drawing, unfortunately, to a close, but a couple questions, and then we'll be available in the room, and you guys can also network among yourselves. Take two questions, and I have the last question. Uh, and I'll say that for the, uh, the last question will be saved for the end. But anyway, uh, Heather? This one wasn't a question, it was just a follow-up to the discussion of the, the cataloging and curation. Um, the TESOL Resource Center um, is still a work in progress, but they ran a competition among all of the intersections for rating and curating content. Some of the content is more um, practical in terms of worksheet type things, but the call interest section contributed the most across all of the intersections out there. Um, so it's been refreshed within the last 
nine months um, with a huge influx of tech-related resources. So if you haven't had a chance, um, check that out. Okay. And then there's something in the back. Yeah. Um, so that might be a place to go. I'm a high school ELL teacher. Not here. High school ELL teacher, I'm just wondering, like you're talking about, when we go back from a conference, we have limited time. So is there a starting point, even if it's imperfect, of uh, resources to direct our students to that are interactive, related to what we're talking about today? I, I mean, we're at TESOL, and the TESOL Resource Center is an incredible call. Uh, go over to the Electronic Village and talk to people in that work and they'll get you pointed and you know, you'll be able to, to, to get some things, they'll be, send you links. I think this is, you know, you're, you're in the right place to, to, to talk to people about starting out. There are lots of places, the trouble is, as colleagues are saying, they're, they're not kind of curated and organized in one, so there's like one place you can go that directs you to things at different levels. Uh, but a couple of pointers, go to the, to the British Council website, britishcouncil.org, they have uh, the Learn English section. They have huge amounts of uh, free material. Uh, some of it is related to mobile apps. Some of it is something you can use on tablets and laptops. Yeah, uh, some of it, <laughs> British American, who cares? AmericanState.gov. AmericanState.gov, which I must say is part of the, it is geared towards international language learners. There is a divide in our organization between what the U.S. government is allowed to propagandize and provide to a domestic audience as opposed to an international audience, even though the reality is in this day and age there is so, um, so little difference. But it is an example of, we have the ladies who were talking about how conservative her teachers are. You want to talk about risk averse? You're talking about my organization. So when you're talking about this curation kind of thing, you can just imagine how all the control freaks of my organization go. You know that about to do it. But AmericanEnglish.state.gov. Just saying. Yeah, so there's some very good um, some individuals, uh, people in call IS, as, as, as somebody just said. Yeah. There's also LTSIG, which is the ITEMPLE version, which has good good resources, and there's uh, several people, some names that you already know, and if you don't know these names, then you should know them because they're really helpful. Uh, Nick Peachy, N-I-K, Peachy, P-E-A-C-H-E-Y, runs about four or five different blogs, so just Google him. He runs different again? blogs with long lists of resources that you can use. Nicky Hockley, who was sitting at the back, Nicky's still there? Yeah. Stand up, Nicky, so everybody can see. One of our paper authors and also a fantastic resource and teacher training person for mobile and everything else technology related. So, Nicky can give you the answers to anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, my question is, we've been talking about devices, we've been pretty much talking about handheld showing pictures of phones and, and tablets, but I'd like to ask our colleague over here about wearable devices, They're wearing Google Glass, do you see a future for Google Glass and watches in the English language classroom? I, I see a future for wearable technologies in the English, class, in the English language classroom. It's in, it's in a test phase right now. I, I mean, I can tell you that I am trying it and testing it in the classroom right now. Uh, in terms of uh, the immediate applications are the, uh, the, the ability to share video in live time to circles. Of course, in third world countries where you don't have the Wi-Fi connectivity, you, you look at things. But, you know, Google Loon, we're looking at putting, you know, balloons in the clouds that are going to bring Wi-Fi to areas that are that are not accessible. There's lots of things that are happening. So Wi-Fi will come along, but the ability to, say, for example, record what I'm doing just by nodding my head and record something that's going on with students to provide immediate feedback that they then have on their devices in terms of a video uh, because it loads it right to YouTube and it's there for them permanently. Um, and, and those technologies, um, they're, they're, they're very interesting. I, I see you nodding your head, so am I being recorded? <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. There's a lot of bad press on that. If, if somebody's wearing Google Glass, you'll know they're recording you because their head can't change it. In other words, to record you, I wouldn't look at you like this. I'd do this. Uh, and then this thing would light up so you would know you're being recorded. It's not It's not as stinky as you might think. You <laughs> see somebody doing this now and it's lit up, then you know something's up. We're going to close in a second, but we'll just, the uh, board member and our, and our author both want to have the last word. So um, you first, because later. Ladies should be off by the way. So I was just going to say that, that <laughs> include with our author. It's not going to require wearables necessarily that, it, that are so difficult to apply the Google Glass. I think I've seen some technologies where it's on board on the regular phone and you can look at a menu in Korean 
pass the phone over the menu. You've seen this working, and it translates into English as you're watching it, and you can learn what the words are. I think, so you know, there, and that's a virtual reality application, right? It's, it's trying to do that. And I think you'll see that when the next year or two start to be more commercially available. And that's an example of something that's just in time. And that, that I love that question. Better. I think it's, it's great. Um, I think that wearable technology is absolutely it's here already in places where people can call them. Not necessarily Google Glass. I'm not sure that's going to work, but certainly smartwatches or different types of smartwatches. I mean, I use wearable technology already, very basic form. Um, so it's not a matter of if this is going to be part of our teaching or if it's going to change anything. It's just another tool. It's going to be as uh, ubiquitous as mobile phones or any mobile devices within the next five years. So the question that we should be asking ourselves is, if our students are really, they already have these tools, how do we integrate them into our classes? Not whether they can change anything or mean anything different, but how do we integrate them into good, solid pedagogical uh, community and language teaching? Sorry. Very good. Okay. Uh, draw your attention to a couple of things. You got little handouts, uh, propaganda for Twitter, um, bookmarks, and um, uh, handout uh, information sheets on our publication and so on. They're on the back uh, chairs. There's more coffee. We have a few minutes. Uh, thank everyone. Uh, please go to the Turk for our website. Not only we hear uh, a lot, of, not only we see a lot about uh, all the stuff we've talked about, but you'll also find more information about Turk and how to become a Turk donor. And uh, these scholarships, the Turk uh, uh, collects and has a fund to provide scholarships for graduate students all around the world. And you know, we've really changed people's lives. People who really had some good research ideas, but they just didn't have the wherewithal to get out and do it. They get a Turk uh, graduate, you know, scholarship. Uh, doctoral gra graduate, doc graduate degree, doctoral, doctoral graduate degree, GDG uh, scholarship, and suddenly they get their, uh, their their degree. They publish their work. They become uh, you know advanced in their careers, and, and it's thanks to people like you, PLU people like us, uh, who uh, donate uh, small or large. All welcome uh, to the turf uh, cause.